4. Ephesians chapter 4. And I know I'm covering a lot of ground, but um, um, it's you know, good if you can discuss some of the things we're talking about. And, uh, uh, and also, you know, as I said the other day, um, you know, back where you're staying, if you can um, go back over the notes and pray over them and let God speak to you. Uh, because what we're doing is trying to sow a lot of seed that hopefully will um, produce fruit in your life. Amen? Yeah. Amen. All right, Ephesians chapter 4. And um, verse 7. To each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. See, see some of the same terminology we've been using? There's a measure or an allotment or an amount, you know, size of our gift, you know. And there's grace according to that. In other words, whatever your calling is, um, God gives you enough grace to fulfill it. There's the same amount of grace as the size of your gift. All right? And then he says, um, verse 8, Therefore he says, When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. And of course we know he's talking about ascending and ascending, but verse 11, And he himself, see, this is um, emphasis on who is the giver. Right? Christ Himself, the King of the Kingdom Himself, nobody else. You see, this is about how He wants to structure His Kingdom. And the church uh, needs to reflect this, because the, if, the, if the church is the ecclesia, which rules and reigns the Kingdom with Christ, then these things are very important, because this is the King Himself determining what the structure and the function and the administering of the Kingdom looks like. So He Himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And then he gives the job description for the fivefold, okay? It, firstly, for the equipping of the saints for the working of the ministry. So the first job of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers is to equip people, to train them and make them able for, for the, their works of service. So a pastor's job is not primarily to care for people. It's not primarily to nurture. <laughs> and our pastor here is smiling. <laughs> See, pastors want to just love the sheep and you know, nurture them and make them feel good and comfortable and you know, good sense of well-being. But that's what will happen naturally under a pastor. But the past, pastor, like it, a prophet or an apostle or an evangelist or a teacher, their, their first thing in their job description is to equip people to be able to fulfill their own destiny. To equip people. In other words, the first thing we have to do is to multiply ourselves in others. All right? And so, apostles will equip people differently from an evangelist. And a prophet will diff equip pe people differently from a teacher. And a pastor will equip people differently from a, a prophet. Why? Because there's a different grace. See, the grace is connected to the gift. That's what we saw here, right? And I, was, I talked about this last session. That apostles have a grace. Paul talks about, to me, was given this grace and apostleship. So there's the amount of grace and the type of grace for the call in our lives. Alright? So then the first thing in the uh, job description for all fivefold people is to equip the believers to be able and empowered to do the work of the ministry and fulfill their calling and their destiny. The second thing is to edify the body, to build them up. Now to build people up means to make them strong, to make them fortified. In other words, to teach them what their authority is, how to flow in the power of God, how to stand when others fall, you know, how, to, um, um, how, how to be strong when others are weak, how to be strong in the areas where they used to be weak. And again, pastors will do it differently from evangelists. Apostles will do it differently from prophets. Why? Because there's a different grace with each calling. That's, this is why we need the fivefold. Alright, so in our picture, you know, the King of Heaven came to planet Earth and brought His Kingdom with Him. Set up His dominion, His domain. Right? The, the, the uh, realm of His authority here on Earth. When He went back, He sent the Holy Spirit as a governor one like him in his place to continue the same work. What happens then is, he, with his ecclesia, he establishes certain kinds of callings 
that are going to actually help the people to fulfill the kingdom mandate. And the, the people are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The foundation of it is on apostles and prophets. But that doesn't mean that evangelists, pastors, and teachers are less. They just have different functions. So it's a little bit like a family. You have father, mother, and children. Everybody's equal in the family. Because we're all human beings, true? Yeah. But everyone has a different role in the family. So apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Apostles aren't greater than the rest or less than the rest or any of that sort of stuff. You know, pastors aren't greater or less than the others in the fivefold. It's like a family. It's like, it's like, you know, if, if you will, it's like the apostle is father, the, uh, the, the prophet is mother, and evangelist, pastor, and teacher are the children. But they form a, a family that administers the kingdom. Do right, you understand? Now, the reason I use that picture is this. The apostle governs, and we know that in the natural, the man is uh, called to be the head. That doesn't mean he's better than everybody else. It simply means he's got a responsibility under God, and, and he's, he's to cover the family. Right, so an apostle is like the father. Now, the mother always sees things differently from the father. True? Yep. <laughs> so the mother will say, uh, you know, we should do this. And the father will say, well, no, I think we should do this. Or <laughs> well, the father will do something and the mother will say, you shouldn't have done it like that. <laughs> Apostle and prophet, I believe that will work very similarly. It's like husband and wife. Because prophets see things differently from apostles, but the foundation is built on both together. Now, in, in our society here, we have a, an ever-increasing percentage of households that only have one parent. Mostly because of divorce. Right? Now the thing about that is that um, there's something lacking in a family that doesn't have a mother or doesn't have a father. True? Yeah. They may not always agree. They may often see things differently. But together, the family works far better. That's God's plan. It's the same with the kingdom. All right? So uh, prophets, uh, to me, are like the, the uh, advisors to the kingdom government. All right? They're the the, uh, the, like the wife of the husband who supports the husband but also knows how to input what's needed to balance the husband, you know, um, but also sees things from a different perspective and will contribute that perspective and together they bring the perspectives together and they get a balance. You see, apostles on their own are not going to be as balanced as they could or should be. Prophets on their own are not going to be as balanced as they could or should be. And one of the problems we've had with the prophetic is that we've had prophets running around the world without being accountable to apostles, yeah. haven't been in accountable relationships, and there's been all kinds of excesses. But then we have apostles also around the world who are not accountable to other apostles, don't have their own spiritual fathers, and so there's excesses or there's things out of order there too that sometimes, you know. The, the safest place we can be is to be in a relationship with people we're accountable to. It, and it's the freest place. I didn't know that until a few years ago. Accountability actually is liberating when it's in the right relationship. If you, if you position yourself and function as a son to the right spiritual father, then your accountability liberates you because the father only wants the best for you. Yeah. But in an organizational structure, you know, we only submit to a certain amount, we only submit functionally in an organizational structure. True? We usually don't submit our hearts in an organizational structure because we're always thinking, well, the guy above me might stand in my way one day. Well, the guy above me might take advantage of me one day. <laughs> Come on, this is true, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So in an organizational structure, we're accountable as far as our function, but we're not accountable as far as our heart is concerned. But if it's father-son, then our accountability is a whole of life accountability. It's a, it's a son's accountability. You know, with my natural sons. You know, I can put my arm around and say, so, hey, how are you going? You know? And they know that I'm not, not going to judge them. They know I love them. If there's something wrong, then I'm going to want to help. If there's something out of order, I'm going to you know, want to help them to get it into order. You know? Um, if they're doing well, I'm going to rejoice with them. You know? And there's freedom. You know, my sons, they're, they're grown up, you know? Uh, they're flourishing. 
Um, they don't lord it over them. I love them. But I'll ask them questions at times and say, so, you know, what's happening in this and what's happening in that? Why? Because I'm their father. And if, if, because they're my sons, I care and I want them to, be, to, be, to account for their lives so that I can cover them, so that I can protect them, so that I can keep things in right order, so they can be blessed. It's the same in the, the spiritual thing, you know? And so we all need to have spiritual fathers, but then in the fivefold, you know, I like the picture of the family where it's like the, the apostle is the father, and that's one of the attributes of apostle which we'll look at sometime. Um, and, but the, 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 the prophet is really like a mother in a family. Wife to the husband and mother to the kids, you know? Who, who, who sees what the, the father doesn't see. You know, the prophet sees what the apostle doesn't see. But the apostle sees the big picture, the prophet sees a part of that picture. But together they'll have, have everything they need, you know? But then, just like a mother is concerned about the kids and activates things and, you know, keeps the house rolling or whatever, prophets are like that. They seem to be jumping into this and that and keeping the, all the kids in the, in the church happy you know, or, or keeping them working or keeping them focused or something, you know, just like a mother in a house, you know? <laughs> And so this is why we need apostles and prophets to work together. Because then in a sense you've got the fathers and mothers of the kingdom, if you will. And I'm not talking about gender when I talk about that, you know what I'm saying. But to use this picture, it's like then we have the fathers and the mothers of the kingdom functioning properly. You know? And then the uh, uh, evangelists, pastors and teachers can find their place. And they can flourish. You know? In a good family where the, the husband and wife uh, have a good relationship and where they're, they're parenting well then the, the children just flourish. They fulfill their potential, true? Mm -hmm. And they grow in character and they're you know, they, able to, to um, succeed in life. You know, well, when apostles and prophets work together properly, then we're going to see the best flowing out of evangelists, pastors and teachers. <laughs> yeah? And it, it means that we're all going to equip the saints more effectively. It also means we're all going to build up the body of Christ more effectively, make it strong, powerful, so that it functions like the Ecclesia. And then it goes on and it talks about, um, uh, till we all come to the unity of the faith. All right, so Chris talked about unity. I don't need to talk about that because he, that was brilliant yesterday, wasn't it? Mm. Uh, and to a perfect man or to maturity. You know, our job is not just to, to get people to uh, come to services, pardon me, and, and run programs and, and stuff like that. Our job is to bring, people, bring the church to maturity. Yep. If we don't bring people to maturity, all we've got is people in a, in a building. Mm. But if, we are gonna, if we're going to develop at the ecclesia, so that people know how to rule and reign in this life with Christ, then our job is to bring them to maturity. Yep. So in this picture that we have, when, when we talk about colonization and that the end goal of colonization is to change the colony to be like the home country, then the way we do that is by maturing the saints. We mature them so they become like Christ. What does that mean? They become like the king. So therefore they represent him effectively in the way he would want to be represented because they are like him. They have matured to be like him. Amen? And then um, the next thing is in verse 15, we establish the kingdom, we establish people, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and flow. So maturity causes people to be established, it causes the kingdom to become strong. Amen? And then um, uh, verse uh, 15, speaking the truth in love may grow up into all things. Yeah, so that really is, we've talked about that already. And then what, verse 16, the whole body joined and knitted together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Do you know that the role of the fivefold, the final part of the picture, is to actually make sure that everybody is in their place according to their calling. So he's using the, the medical imagery here. You know that if, um, if my arm is not attached to my shoulder, if it's attached somewhere else, it's not going to function properly because it's not in its right place. So we need to be connected right in the kingdom. And in, in the life of a local church, we need to make sure people are connected right. So they're connected relationally as well as connected functionally. And then it tells us that what will happen then is that there is that the, where they're joined will, will cause life to flow. It's by what every joint supplies. 
causes effective working. If we just have people in a building and we just herd them into programs, then they're not connected. They're not connected properly relationally. It's just a functional connection, yeah? Or a social connection. It's not actually a covenant relational connection. But then also, if they're not connected properly with others who they're supposed to be working with or supposed to be connected to uh, in their hearts and, and relationally and so on, there's not going to be life flowing in the body. And so that's why we have churches where it's all about what happens from the pulpit. Because we've got a, a room full of people and uh, we've got them all herded into different programs and got them all serving. Uh, and, and, the, and we're trying to get the life to flow from the pulpit into the church and through the church. But there's no life actually flowing in the body. But in the kingdom, we are to equip them so that they are able to fulfill their calling and destiny. We are to build them up so they stand strong and others fall. We are to bring them to maturity so they represent the king the way he would want to be represented. Um, we are to establish them so that they will be, we, uh, be strong and will be able to fight battles and win them. You know, And, um, and we are to then make sure that, that there is this relational uh, covenant thing flowing in the life of the church. Um, where, whereby people actually are connected relationally and in covenant relationship one, with one another so that life flows. Amen? So the ministry flows. So it's organic. And what happens then is that the growth of the body is self-perpetuating. It says it, it causes growth of the body um, uh, by the edifying of itself in love. In other words, something um, happens that then the, it's not only a foundation established and we begin to build on it, but we come to a place of um, critical mass where then it multiplies itself. Not just numbers, but multiplies the character of Christ. Multiplies the, the supernatural aspect of the kingdom. Multiplies the understanding of how to be sons of the house and sons of God and sons and daughters of spiritual fathers and mothers, you know. All of this stuff get, begins to naturally multiply. You see, we're so busy trying to grow our churches, we don't actually let God help us to come to this place where things naturally multiply. But the more we pour into people's lives and bring them to maturity and equip them and make them strong and establish them and connect them right in relationship, then what's going to happen is there comes a place where the life within it continues, begins to just um, automatically multiply. Mm. That's why it says in the Word of God that the sowing and reaping will end up happening at the same time. Mm. Yeah. We'll still be sowing, but we'll be reaping at the same time. You know? Yeah. Now, in the natural, you can't do that. You've got to harvest and then re -sow. But not spiritually, not in the supernatural kingdom. It's supposed to function in a way whereby we're sowing in the message of the kingdom into people's lives. We're sowing in our community. We're sowing, you know, in, in all kinds of ways. But we're reaping at the same time. So there's sowing and there's growth and there's harvest and there's, it's all happening at the same time. How does that happen? If we do what the uh, firefold is here to do, then we're going to produce a, a culture, as Chris was saying, and an environment where this thing multiplies itself. Where the life within the body simply begins to give birth to more things, and more things, and more things. And we're not just multiplying numbers, we're multiplying the character of, of the king. We're multiplying what the kingdom is, is about. Amen? You see that in the early church. Acts chapter 2, you know, it talks about the, the thousands that came into the kingdom after Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. But from verse, I think, 42 to 47, it's amazing. It doesn't just go straight from that to Acts chapter 3, talking about the miracle at the temple, you know, the lame man. It puts in half a dozen verses that tell us what was actually being multiplied. As the thousands came in, it tells us what they did. They continued in the apostles' doctrine. They continued in prayer. They continued... In fellowship, they continued in the breaking of bread. There was miracles continued. They, they had all things in common. There was a spirit of generosity. And the list goes on. What's it talking about? It's talking about the attributes of the kingdom that got multiplied. Which is what Paul's talking about here. That it, it edifies itself and grows and builds itself up and continues to multiply itself. And it's the quality that kept multiplying as the, the quantity multiplies. Amen? If we have quantity without quality, we don't have the kingdom. If we have quality without quantity, we also don't have the kingdom. Because if the quality is there, it will multiply itself. Yep. Amen? Amen? Yeah. All right. So, I talked to, uh, uh, quite a bit about apostles last um, uh, last session. I've touched on, on prophets. Um, do you know, evangelists, um, 
I believe, function best in the strategies of apostles. Uh, for many years I was uh, called an evangelist, and it was because I had a passion for souls, and uh, uh, a lot of people got saved wherever I went, and there was always a lot of miracles. And I preached to big crowds and all that kind of stuff. But the thing I discovered was that those things are the signs of an apostle also. So they're not only the zone of an evangelist. But here's the thing. Apostles are strategic by nature. All right? And so therefore evangelists need the strategic aspect of an apostle so they can know where to go and, and what's going to be needed to back them up or what to complement them with. All right? Now for many decades now we've had evangelists all over the world we go out and preach to crowds and a lot of people come to Christ and so on. But in most places the church does not grow as a result of crusades. It's a statistical fact over many decades. All right? So for me, I began, and it's because of the, the, the calling in my life which I didn't understand at the time, I began to train church planters because I, I began to realise that if you planted a church when you did a crusade, you would keep more of the fruit. Right? And so I began, became a church planter and I began to train church planters. And so therefore we would uh, go and do crusades but with a view to planting a church and we would end up with more people staying in the kingdom. You know? and so but this was, this was the, um, the apostle side of me coming out. You know? Wanting to equip people and edify them and, and release them into their calling and see this thing multiply. You know? But... Um, but here's the thing, evangelists don't have the same strategic perspective that apostles have. Uh, and unfortunately, over the decades, we've, you know, evangelists have been driven by the size of the crowds because, um, well, it looks successful if you've got big crowds. Secondly, by the, um, the fact that the, the pictures of, of, of the, the altar calls and the size of crowds actually help to raise money. Uh, and, and to be really honest, evangelists might give lip service to a whole lot of spiritual things, but often they're driven by the size of the crowd and the amount of money involved. You know? Or the possibility of raising money to keep themselves going. Um, I remember being uh, told by evangelist friends of mine years ago, Phil, you've got to, you know, you've got to preach the big pulpits and get the big offerings, you know, because, you know, that, yeah. Man. And I did preach in, you know, most of the biggest churches in this country. But I want to tell you something. I, I know today with a different perspective that sometimes sitting at a table with a, you know, a strategic person and having a word from God can sometimes have far greater kingdom impact than preaching in, in the biggest church in the country. It can also have the more, leave the more lasting results than preaching to tens of thousands of people. You know, and so uh, if, I believe that if evangelists work with, uh, with, with apostles and, and in a, an apostolic strategy, then there's going to be fruit that remains like never before and will actually advance the kingdom, not just get a lot of decisions cards filled out. You know? So then, where's this in the scripture? Well, Acts 8 is where I see it in the scripture. Philip goes down to Samaria. And they went because of persecution, but they didn't, they, they, they're an apostolic people, so they went with purpose. They went preaching about the kingdom. So all through the cities of Samaria, he just has this incredible move of God. And um, there's, uh, there's healings, there's uh, deliverances, there's um, uh, great joy in the cities, many conversions. Huge move of God. So he's got a whole bunch of people saved, a lot of miracles, even significant people, power brokers like Simon the Sorcerer coming to the kingdom, you know. This is really successful. He could have gone back to Jerusalem and said, oh man, Talk about an evangelist, I'm it. <laughs> you know, I'm the best evangelist that, um, that we've got, you know. Sorry, I thought the, thought the ring was off. Okay. You know, he could have gone back and said, I've been so successful. I've been through the cities of Samaria. You know, there was healings, there was deliverances, there was, you know, huge numbers converted and coming to the kingdom. The cities are just full of joy. It's fantastic. No, he sent word back to Jerusalem to the apostles. When Peter and John came there. Yeah? 
Because apostles have strategies that establish. Evangelists don't. That's why we have evangelists who have, and many evangelists have burned out and are living disheartened lives because they've been out there and they've, they've given their all but feel like they've established nothing for the kingdom. They need to work alongside uh, apostles in order to, to, to see their, their work established and to see things established through their ministry. And so <coughs> Peter and John come down to Samaria and um, they look around and they go, well, great <coughs> miracles happening everywhere, deliverance is happening, conversion's happening, everyone's excited, but none of these people are filled with the Holy Ghost yet, so they start getting everybody filled with the Holy Spirit because that's something that, that uh, Philip didn't do. So they immediately added something that, that wasn't happening. But then, of course, they exposed, and I've already talked about this, that the, the government of the kingdom in us exposes things. The apostolic grace exposes things. So it exposed what was in the heart of Simon the sorcerer. Now, if they hadn't exposed that and dealt with it, the fact that he had got saved didn't mean everything was wonderful. Because he still wanted power. Right? So he had become converted, but he hadn't actually laid down his desire for power and surrendered that to the king. And it took the apostolic grace to expose that. Now the churches would never have got established and the fruit of, of um, Philip the Evangelist's ministry would have been dissipated if they had not exposed that in Dublin. So there's so many issues that apostles and prophets together will actually um, deal with and you know, bring right order and establish that will conserve the, the results of evangelistic ministry. There are strategies to as to how we uh, mobilize evangelists and where and when that will help them to be more effective. But then there are things that apostles and prophets can bring that, that evangelists will never have. But there are things evangelists bring that apostles and prophets won't have either. Because they bring such a passion for uh, such a, a sense of eternity and such a passion for the lost and, and such a passion for the miraculous and, you know, and such a desire to bring people into the kingdom. You know? And that, so they're like the, the pointy end of the spear. They just, boom, cut through, you know? But once they've cut through and there's a whole lot of stuff happening, then they're outside of their grace zone. Yeah? Yeah. And what do they need? They actually need to be in covenant relationship with the apostle and the prophet. You know? So there's a strategic name of the apostle. There's the insight of the prophet. There's the activation of the prophet. And there's the, 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 uh, the, the bringing order from the apostle to establish the fruit so that it remains. Yeah? Alright, so then pastors. Pastors are, um, in fact, if you want to, uh, I, I believe there's a case study for each of the fivefold in the New Testament. And uh, so Acts 8, I think, it, for me, is uh, the evangelist. Um, the, uh, I haven't got, I just don't have time to get into all the stuff. Um, but um, we've got um, uh, set DVD sets and I've got books written now with this kind of stuff in it. They'll be available at the conference. But I, I want to just sow a lot of seeds for you to go away and pray about, all right? But I believe that the, um, the pattern for pastoring is Psalm 23. If you read Psalm 23 as a sequence, right, a sequence. In other words, it starts at the start and then it unfolds the role of the pastor. All right? So the Lord is my shepherd. Firstly, people need to acknowledge him as King and Lord. And they need to establish him as the one who leads and guides their lives. The Lord is my shepherd. So a pastor's job is to actually establish them in their relationship with the Lord. Okay? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. pastor's job is to bring a revelation of him being the source. So therefore they will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, knowing that he will add everything they need. That, that Jesus is their source. Right? I better go to it so I don't forget what, what all the lines are. <laughs> Right, but I want to suggest this to you, that I believe that Psalm 23 gives us a pattern for pastoral ministry in the kingdom, which will help pastors to not just be nurturers, but will actually give pastors a kingdom purpose in how they release their pastoral grace to their people. Right? So the Lord is my shepherd. In other words, pastors are to actually connect people to Christ as their king and that they will draw from him, all right? not from anything else. So a pastor's job is not for people to depend on them, but to teach people to depend on, 
on the Lord. He makes me lie down in green pastures. In other words, pastures are to bring people a place to a place where they know how to live with rest of soul. Jesus said, if you're tired and weary, come to me and I'll give you rest in your soul. Pastor's job is to teach people how to enter into the peace of the kingdom. Lie beside still waters. Amen? Um, sorry, green pastures. That's, that's lie beside still waters. Green pastures, how to feed on the word for themselves. See, a, a shepherd can lead a sheep to the, to the green pastures, but he's not going to eat for them. <laughs> Some shepherds try to eat for their people. And they spoon feed them and keep them immature all their lives. No. A pastor's job is to lead them to, and teach them how to feed from the Word. How to, how to feed themselves in prayer and, and in communion with God and how to grow. Amen? And so, and then how to, how to enter into the peace of the kingdom and have rest of soul. It leads me beside still waters. Number three, he restores my soul. So a pastor's job is to actually bring people to wholeness. To restore their souls. Now here's the problem. When we get to here, people think the job's done. So we've got people in the church who, uh, you know, who are following Jesus. They pray and ask, ask the Lord to help them and so on. Uh, the iron shall not want. They, uh, they, they've, they've learned how to, how to read the word and so on. And, and, uh, you know, and, and they've, they've, they've come to a place, some sort of place of rest of soul. And, and, and they've got restored in areas of their lives. We think, okay, we've done the job. But all we are is up to the first part of the chapter, verse 3. There's a lot more yet, all right? Because this is about shepherding. So then once people have a restoration going on in their lives and they're coming to wholeness, then it says he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. So now they've got to be taught how to be led by the Holy Spirit in a way that will bring right order in their lives. Righteousness is God's right order. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So he leads me. So they must must follow Jesus in a way that brings right order in every part of their life. They have a path of right order. So that His name is honoured through their lives. So this is beyond the restoration or wholeness coming into people's lives. See? So this is the next step. And then, it's, then the pastor's job, verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. So the pastor then is to bring people to a, a place where they... Have no fear, but they walk by faith and not by sight. Where they know their authority, they know their power. They might be in the valley of the shadow of death. They're not fearing any evil because they know that they're sons and daughters of the king. And they know the king's with them. And there's a confidence and a strength and a power about their lives. Yeah? And then they know that your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What's that? Rod is authority. Staff is actually what they use to bring them back from, from drifting away. Yeah? So what, what, it's, what it's saying is that pastors then are to bring people to a place where they know their authority and where they know the protection of God and the boundaries of God for their lives so that they can go through things and come out triumphant. Amen? And then verse 5. There's more for pastors that pastors can do. <laughs> you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Wow, I'll tell you what, that's confidence. That's strength. That's, you know, that's knowing who you are, isn't it? Yeah, that you can relax and enjoy a meal in the presence of your enemies. <laughs> this, is the, this is kingdom stuff. This is the colonization stuff. We are from another country, but we're here on planet Earth, and we're, we're, you know, we're at war against the other kingdoms that are on this planet. But it says here, you prepare a table before. We live in blessing in the midst of war. We're partying in a battle zone. <laughs> There's joy in us while we're attacking the enemy or while we're under attack or while we're dealing with problems or issues. There's a joy in us. Now, pastors are called to produce this in people's lives. Not just the first few things. There's a whole lot more, right? Then, um, uh, you anoint my head with oil. Anoint means to be set apart for purpose. So a pastor's ministry actually is to ultimately help people to find their purpose in God. They're calling. My cup runs over. They, they minister out of the overflow of the anointing in their lives. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. They're living in the kingdom lifestyle. So if you look at that as a sequence, it becomes a great uh, pattern to be able to train pastors 
and to be able to change the pastoral ministry in your churches so that it's more than just nurturing people or caring for people or, or you know or, or helping people who are in trouble, but where it's proactive, where there's a plan to take people from the start, where they come to know Jesus, and what do we do then? Well, here's the pattern in Psalm 23. If you look at it as a sequence from one to the next to the next to the next. See, if pastors do this, they complement apostles and prophets. Because the apostle will you know, bring the word of the Lord as a, a, a directional thing, a, a governmental thing, a, you know, a strategic thing. And the pastors will say, I know how that's going to work to take the people I'm pastoring to the next step in their lives. So they break it down to the individual. Yeah? And that's the, to me, that's the strength of the pastor in the, in the kingdom context. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Let's talk about the teacher. Again, you know, we've had teachers who, who um, have traveled the world and teaching their deep truths and all that kind of thing. Um, do you know, we have a, a pattern in the New Testament to help us with this. And um, the, I believe the case study of the teacher is Apollos. And while he was later on uh, called a, a, um, an apostle, when he was, um, in the early stages, he, he was recognized as a teacher. Let's go to Acts, uh, I'm not sure what chapter it is now. Um, here we go, Acts 18. Acts 18, a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being firm in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, although he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, and when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And, he, and when he arrived, he helped, greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. I believe this man had a teaching gift in his life. And even when he was later on acknowledged, uh, called an apostle, you know, he had this teaching gift as part of his gift mix. All right? So we see here, he was an eloquent man. He had an ability to speak. Teachers need that. He was mighty in the scriptures. He knew the word of God. All right? He'd been instructed. So he had actually been taught. Um, he was fervent in spirit. He was passionate about the Word of God. He taught accurately. So he, 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 he was very clear uh, about the Word of God. He spoke boldly. He was fearless. Um, he was teachable. Because um, Priscilla and Aquila took him aside and explained things to him more accurately. So he heard that he was teachable himself. Uh, and then um, others received him. He greatly helped them, and he vigorously refuted. Man, we need teachers like this. Yeah? You look at those, there's about 10 characteristics there that I just mentioned. If we have teachers like that, that'll be powerful. But here's the thing. I believe that teachers need to follow apostles. Because teachers can break down what the apostles are, you know, are, are giving under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and they can break it down so that people can understand how to live it. I don't believe that the teaching gift is, is so that teachers can impress everybody with their deep knowledge and deep truths. You know, I don't think that's what it's about at all. And I don't think teachers are supposed to be out, you know, promoting their own ministries and all that. You know, we see in, in, in uh, Corinthians, in fact, it's the end of 2 Corinthians, why don't we go there? 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I think it is. Paul understands the value of having a teacher of the caliber of, of um, Apollos, you know, with those ten characteristics we just saw, uh, going to places where he had himself had been because he would break down the, the message or the doctrine of the Apostle in a way that, that it would establish the people and people could actually know how to, how to live it. He would, he would help them with the implementation and the application of the Apostle's doctrine. All right? And I believe this is the role and, and the, um, where the teachers will be most effective. And in my team, um, you know, the people in my team understand this. And often, members of my team, when they preach, they'll preach the stuff I preach. But they preach it so differently. 
And what they do is they'll, they'll be, you know, the, the teacher will be teaching stuff and laying it in. And people, some people will say afterwards, isn't that the same stuff that Phil preached a few weeks ago? You know? But that's how a teacher should function, because they take the, the apostle doctrine to use the New Testament term, and they break it down so that people get it and know how to put it into place in their lives. Because often apostles are shooting for the horizon. And the prophets are seeing somewhere between here and the horizon. And the teachers will say, well, yeah, he's talking about down there, but this is what it means to you today and this week. <laughs> yeah? And the pastors are saying, look, it's okay. You don't have to worry too much about 10 years away, because um, that's where the apostles are living right now. But, <laughs> but I'm going to help you with what the teacher's telling you, and I'm going to help you to grow the next step and mature the next phase, you know? And then the evangelist is roaming around, and he says, oh, man, you know, the, uh, the apostles tell you know, this and this and this, and come on, you know, um, we, 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 need to, uh, you know, we need to get up and go for it. We need to take this message and, you know, impact our community, you know? And, and uh, I'm going to give the apostles strategy, you know? Where do we go next? What do we do next? And he fires everybody up, you know? And the prophet's going to be going, yeah, but if you're going to do that, man, you need to be flowing in the in word of knowledge and word of wisdom, and I need to lay hands on you for that. See how we need it all? Yeah. Now, you can't have all five in every church, but to, to actually administer the kingdom properly, we need the influence of all five. Yep. Which means that if you don't have all five in your local church, mm -hmm. you need to build covenant relationships with the ones you don't have. And even with some that you already have, you need to maybe build covenant relationships with others of the same because they will have a different flavor again. But they have to have the same sound. We speak in the same language. They have to, it has to be covenant relationship. You see, Chris can come to my church any time. And he says, he says to me, I'm his son, but he says to me, what do you want me to do? I say, Chris, whatever God gives you, whatever you feel to do, go for it. You know? But if any members of his team come, I say the same thing. So recently we had a prophet from his team come and preach in our church. But he, he's a, a great man. He said, when I asked him to come, because I said to Chris, I'd like to have him come. And Chris said, yeah, we'll talk to him, you know. So I talked to him. He said, look, Philly, so I'm going away on holidays. He said, I'll seek the Lord. And if God gives me a word, then, I'll, then we'll organize a day. I love that. He's not just going to come and preach a message. He'll only come if God gives him a word for our church. See, this is the, how the kingdom works. And I've known this man since back in the late 80s. So we have a long-standing relationship. You know? So then we organize the date. And he rings me up and he says, Phil, um, what's God doing? You know, is there anything particular? I said, no, Paul. I said, you, whatever God gives you, you just go for it, you know? Um, I said, I trust you. You know, we're, we're heart to heart, you know? <laughs> you, you understand where we're at because we're about the kingdom like you guys are, you know? So we've got this relationship. So I've got a prophet in my house, but Paul comes. He's a prophet. He, he preaches a, a, just a word in season for our church. Fantastic it was. Yeah, you were there, Rocky. Yeah, yeah. It was just brilliant, wasn't it? Yeah. But he's a different kind of prophet. Yeah. So we need more than just the ones that are in our own team. We need to build relationships, but they've got to be covenant relationships, so that people understand, oh, this is an opportunity to preach something from so and so's pulpit. Man, that stuff stinks, eh? Mm. I hate that, you know. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm preaching in such and such a church. Big deal. What does the king want? <laughs> It's not about I'm preaching at so-and-so's church or I'm preaching in front of this size crowd. Who cares? God in heaven doesn't care. He, he's, he's interested in, 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 in advancing his kingdom and how are we going to listen to the governor and how the, the apostles are listening to the governor and strategizing under his leading and guiding, how the prophets are getting insight so that the apostles don't miss anything. You know, they add their thing to it. You know, and, and you hear what I'm saying today? Yeah. God's interested in how His kingdom is administered according to His pattern, not according to our excitement yeah. or our ego, you know? Mm. So I love that when Paul said, well, you know, when I'm away on holidays, I'm going to pray that God gives me a word and I'll, ring, I'll let you know and we can organize a day. Man, I'll have him back any time to preach. That's kingdom to me, you know? And, and, and he just blessed that church, added something to that church, you know? And um, so... In, in all of this, what I'm, the reason I'm talking about the fivefold the way I am is to get you to understand in the context of what we've talked about here. Yeah? Otherwise, what's going to happen is we're going to keep our concepts of church structure and life and authority and programming, 
and try to fit, somehow fit the fivefold in, you know, and we're going to end up giving up because it's not going to work. You can't, you know, put together old wine skin and new wine skin. You know, um, we can't just have many structures uh, and, and try to put, you know, God's thing in it. We need God's structure for His kingdom, and then learn how to flow in that. And um, so then, how do you do this in a local church? I think this is important for me to touch on this to finish the, the time today. Um, I'm fortunate that having a you know, being called to be an apostle and then people being called to plant and lead this church, that makes it easy for me, if you will. Right? Because um, God just keeps bringing uh, fivefold people in the life of our church. Yep. You know, Chris, Chris spoke in the last couple of days about um, the kind, you know, the, that there's been all kinds of stuff going on in his church and all kinds of pressures and accusations and all, all sorts of things. But in the midst of it, God's been doing amazing things. You know, and so this property, you know, that he's talking about that's been offered has happened in the middle of all this stuff. You know, man can try all kinds of things and not even know what they're doing. But if we just stand and hold the line and let the Holy Spirit be the governor of the kingdom. And, and understand, if you're an apostle, understand the grace that's on your life. And that at some point, you're going to see the king do his thing. You know, at some point, the supernatural is going to be released. At some point, the governor is going to give you a strategy and you're going to know when, what to do and when to do it and how to do it. And, you know, same thing happened for us. We had a real upheaval in our church towards the end of last year in the first month or so, of the, or a couple of months of this year. In the middle of it, you know, I had people saying I was wrong in how I was running the church. People saying I'm not tithing to this place anymore. All kinds of stuff going on, you know. All this fleshly stuff was happening. And I just had to hold the line. Because it's his church, it's not mine. So I don't have to run around trying to fix it all. Only if he tells me to. Because he's the Lord of the church, not me. It's his church. And if it's going to mature to truly be an ecclesia, then... People have got to actually go through stuff that will mature them. And they have to see me model things also that they will then put into place in their own lives. So I just held the line. I preached the stuff I, I felt God wanted me to preach. I was pretty strong about some of the things I said because I felt I needed to cut through some things, you know. And um, But here's what happens. In the middle of all this stuff go, that's going on, God brought in three more fivefold people into our church. Anoki, who's an evangelist and church planner, a pastor who's been out of active ministry for years, and God's restoring lives and ministries and calls. It's awesome. Um, an apostle from Africa, which has, you know, been part of the opening up of the strategy that I mentioned the other day, you know, for that continent. You know, all of that happened in the middle of all this upheaval. Here's the thing. If, if you're not an apostle, you need to have an apostle who will be un immovable, unshakable. If you are an apostle, then one of the things about being an apostle is you're immovable. Paul said, you know, okay, I'm going to Jerusalem, the prophets are all saying there's going to be trouble and there's going to be pain and there's going to be all these things happen, but none of these things move me, he said. See, that's what apostles are like. There's just something about them that is immovable. So stuff's going on in my church, I'm immovable. Pastors find that hard if they're leaving the church. They get all upset about who's getting hurt and, you know, they're trying to make people feel better. <laughs> evangelists just want to attack. Because the evangelist is wired that way. You know, it's like, you just go for it. You go after it. You know? So when things are out of order, you just... Burr. Unless they understand the kingdom. You know? Teachers will want to just kind of tie everything down. You know, it's like a ship that's on the ocean in a storm. They want to back all the hatches down and make sure nothing moves anymore. You know, <laughs> and so they'll be bringing out the word of God and going, "You can't do this, and you must do that." And the word says this. <laughs> and prophets will be seeing things, but they'll be seeing so much that they'll get confused if they don't have an apostle to give clear direction. Because they'll see all the stuff that's going on and all the things behind them, and the things that are in people's hearts, and you know, and they'll be they want to run around giving words to everybody and dealing with this and that. But sometimes the best thing we do is keep our mouths shut and stand and wait and let God do stuff. Mm. And an apostle knows how to do that because that's part of the grace. So if you don't have an apostle, in, or if you're not an apostle leading the church, then you need to have one who you can call on, who will be immovable. 
And who would just stand and say, hey, it's okay. Yeah, there's all this stuff going on. You're in the middle of the storm. But it's okay. This, this is about the king and his kingdom. It's not about this stuff. See, this is why we need governments by apostles. And the apostle will say to the evangelist, you know, if an evangelist went in the church, the apostle will say, it's okay, relax. The evangelist goes, I can't relax. We've got to do something. <laughs> so you're not alone. It's just how evangelists are, you know. <laughs> um, and the apostle will say, no, it's okay. We're going to wait until God gives us strategy. And if we stand still, we're going to see the salvation of our God, you know. And God's going to open some stuff up. And the apostle will say to the pastor, you know, if it's a pastor leading church, he'll say, listen, yet, yeah, unfortunately, sometimes there's casualties in war. And sometimes we just have to, you know, handle it. We don't want it. We don't like it. We do everything to not, to make sure it doesn't happen. But sometimes things happen. So let's not panic and try and run around and make everybody feel good or run around and try and fix everything, you know. But let's actually get God's strategy here. Yeah. Just step back a bit, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, love your heart. But you've got to have your head engaged as well as your heart, you know. <laughs> see, this is, you see how it all works together. What it means is that, that um, there's strengths and weaknesses to each of the gifts, each of the callings. And this is why we need each other. None of us have got the whole package. Yeah. You know? I need my team. Man, do I need my team. You know, sometimes the pastors in my church say things and I think, yeah, I should have thought of that. And then I realise, no, I would never have thought of that because I'm not a pastor. <laughs> I love people, but I'm not called to be a pastor, you know. Um, and, um, you know, and sometimes, you know, Deb, who's our prophet, you know, she'll say, well, Phil, what about this and this and this? And I'll go, yeah, she's right. Yep, we've got to do that, you know. You see, we need each other. Because none of us have got the whole package. If, if you're an evangelist, you need an apostle over you, but you need pastors around you. Because they'll soften you. Apostles need pastors also on their team because they soften them, you know. Prophets need pastors around them. They need to work with pastors because, again, they'll soften them. Because sometimes a prophet will see something and just want to go for it in the spirit. But a pastor will suddenly see the, the response, you know, in a person's eyes or their body language. And, and, and they'll get a, 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 you know, a, a bit of discernment, perhaps, and get a bit of a warning. And, and they'll want to just grab the, you know, the prophet's arm and just, just kind of, hey, slow down a bit, you know. <laughs> see, because we all have strengths and weaknesses, but together we produce the, the best ministry. Yeah? And if we're talking about advancing the kingdom, it's not just apostles who advance the kingdom, and it's not just evangelists who advance the kingdom. We need all of them. Yep. Absolutely. Because when we establish a new outpost, maybe an evangelist is sent in, mm -hmm. and then the apostle comes and brings some order, and the prophet as well, and so on, and activates things and whatever, and then we say, well, hey, where are the pastors? Not because we want to just keep the flock happy, but because we need to mature these people now. Mm -hmm. Where are the teachers? We need to build foundations into these people, you know? And uh, so if we're advancing the kingdom, we need all the fivefold. This is why Jesus didn't just come as king and then set up man's kind of structure. He came and set up a different structure. It's all about calling and grace and the functions of each grace. And the fact is we need to work together because it's not about having someone who's at the top of the tree who is the boss who knows it all and everybody else is just an underling who serves. You know, that's not the kingdom at all. The kingdom is we're all equal in this, but we're all called to different things. We have different kinds of authority, different kinds of grace. We need to find our place and how to work together, appreciate each other's strengths and weaknesses, know how to build covenant relationships so that we can cover one another, not in the sense of covering wrong things, but so that we can cover our weaknesses by adding our strengths to each other's weakness. My team does, does that for me, and I do it with them, and they do it with each other, because it's how it is, you know. Um, and sometimes, you know, as Chris was saying about love, you know, there's a bit of a thing out there in the church, you know, oh, we just need to love people and, and give them hope and everything will be wonderful, you know. And I want to tell you that, that um, sometimes the best way to love someone is to actually, you know, tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, hang on, I think we need to stop and rethink this, you know. If we love them, we don't want them to walk into danger or into a trap, you know. And uh, it's like if you love your child, you don't just say, when they're walking out onto the motorway, you don't just say, oh, I love you, son. <laughs> I hope you do all right out there. Have a good day. <laughs> if, if your son's going out to play amongst the traffic, you run out and you say, get back here. <laughs> Why? Because you love them. You know, and so in the fivefold, if, if there's covenant relationships, then there is genuine affection, but there is also robustness. 
Do you understand the word robust? You know? There's a robustness in relationships where we're secure in our, ourselves, we're secure with one another, we know what we add to each other, we know what our own grace is, we know um, what other people's grace is, we, we know how to allow them to add their strength where we're weak, and we know how to pour our strength into their weakness. And together under the leading of the Holy Spirit, we can do great things for the kingdom of God. And the synergy of the fivefold produces supernatural outcomes. It really does. We are seeing our people just mature and grow and become strong like you would not believe. It's not always easy. It's painful for some people because sometimes there's things in the foundation of their lives that will be uprooted and changed. But you know, if people will go the journey, then where the fivefold is, then they actually come to maturity. And they begin to multiply themselves. Their lives begin to pour into other people's lives. And the kingdom begins to be extended. Amen? Amen. Alright, let's stand and pray, shall we?